this will be a talk with some deep water slides. I don't know if we can turn the lights down a little bit, but this is not bad for visual. Next slide, please. Now, the first part of this talk is the story of the Japanese submarine I-400, and some of you may be aware of this technological innovation during the last days of World War II. This idea of a, a very large submarine that could launch not just observation planes, but a strike plane actually goes back to Admiral Yamamoto. But in general, this is a story of a little too little, a little too late. 18 were planned, only three were ever completed, and only two went into active combat service in the last days of World War II. So I, we don't know that it would really have changed anything if they actually had been able to successfully strike. You can see here, though, the large submarine with the watertight hangar on the deck beneath the sail, the recovery crane, which of course folds down on the forward deck, and the, uh, the interesting parallel side-by-side -side cylinder hull for stability in this very large boat, and the asymmetry of the sail, the superstructure, next to the ramp and the hangar. Uh, 400 feet long with a range of 37,500 miles it was astounding at that time. And I think, as, as Dr. Hattendorf mentioned earlier, to me, this is that element of, of the essence of uh, oceanic power, the ability to pop up anywhere in the world and actually launch a strike. Next slide, please. These were the largest submarines that had been built in their day until 1961, actually, uh, when you have the uh, Allen-class Polaris ballistic missile subs. And here's a comparison of these Sentoku, or special type aircraft carrier submarines, to modern submarines at 377 feet long. And here's a cutaway of that watertight hangar with three of the aircraft with folded wings and disassembled pontoons inside that hangar. So truly astounding and a surprise to us when we first encountered these right after the war. Next slide, please. This is not a concept that was new to the Japanese Navy, of course. Many had experimented with this type of thing, as you know, as, as the US Navy had. In the 1920s, here's an early S-class boat, the S-4, with a watertight hangar and a folding scout plane that can come out of the hangar, then the submarine can then submerge, the float plane can take off and land on the ocean, submarine comes back up, hopefully picks up the float plane, and it goes back in the hangar. But this is not a concept that we took, you know, to any level that the Imperial Japanese Navy did, obviously. And this program ran for a few years and then moved in other directions. Uh, you know, and the same can be said of the banned mini-subs. Uh, in World War II. Many navies had experimented with them. The Japanese Navy had took them to their refinement with the ones that were used in the attack here. Next slide, please. The aircraft that came out of that hangar were not just observation planes, but strike aircraft. And here you can see the M6A1 Seiran aircraft, uh, which were fairly speedy and had a range of 550 miles and a capability of carrying a bomb or a torpedo. And they had three of those inside that watertight hangar. Uh, 28 of these were built. None ever saw combat, combat again. Uh, just a little too little, a little too late in the conflict. And the one last existing example is, of course, at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And this is a wonderful sight to see. Now, they, they say that uh, the deck assembly time is 10 minutes after that submarine came up. I don't, I don't know if that was true or not. Seems awfully fast to me. Next slide. Some of the, the more ambitious ideas were with a submarine and strike capability like that, and in fact with two or three of them, you could pop up anywhere in the world and attack a city like New York. In this case, there was a plan to attack the locks, the Panama Canal, which of course would have threatened our ability to transfer forces between the theaters of war at the time. Uh, but again, it's just too ambitious to carry out and to actually enact. Next slide. 
So it was actually put into motion was a strike at Ulithi Atoll on the Caroline Islands towards the last days of the war when at that time uh, the third fleet has I think 15 aircraft carriers in Ulithi Atoll preparing for the final push against the homeland of Japan. I-400 and the sister sub I-401 sortied from their base in Japan. Uh, there were two phases to this plan. The first was to send smaller types of aircraft carrying Japanese submarines, like the I-14, uh, which carried a couple of scout planes in, to first assess that the, the ships were indeed in place at Ulithi. And then the large Sentoku I-400 class subs would deliver the combined six Seiran strike planes in a kamikaze attack on Ulithi Atoll. But this is right at the end of the war. You can see their route sends them south and uh, east of their target. Before they ever got to the point to deploy their aircraft, though, uh, the war was over. Next slide. The orders were for submarines to um, you know, stay at the surface, return to their bases, and uh, that's what these subs did. And they were actually you know, discovered by the U.S. Navy fairly close to their base back in Japan. The USS Blue and the USS Segunda found the I-400 and the I-401 respectively. And you can imagine the tense moment of when the American crews go on board. It's and kind of in a broad sense, it always brings to mind Admiral Perry in Japan in the 1850s and the tensions and thankfully peaceful uh, events that transpired there. But there were obviously tense moments on board when the Americans took over these craft, brought them back to Japan. Um, and then ultimately, these vessels are brought back to Hawaii. The I-400 itself is sunk as a target asset off the south shore of Oahu in 1946 by USS Trumpet Fitch. Next slide. Here's a picture of three of these, the 400, the I-14, and the 401 lined up in Pearl Harbor and being examined by the Navy here uh, for these various advancements, the large catapult ramps, the size, et cetera, uh, at Pearl Harbor. Now, the, the story goes that our allies, the Russians, wish to share with us the examination of this new technology. And we were less than willing to do that. I don't know if that's true or not. It would take a little more research <coughs> to find documentation of that. Uh, but after a number of months, 10 months, we were apparently done with our examination and they were consigned to target assets off of the South Shore, being brought out of Pearl Harbor to be sunk in deep water. It's, they're really a tremendous size. It's interesting to see that large pointed hangar door and the superstructure and the ramps, et cetera. Next slide, please. So this is the shot that we have of the I-400 being put down on June 4th. Uh, I don't think we have the movie of this. There is a clip of the I-14 being sunk, which is, I believe, available online. Uh, but. There were two torpedo strikes, I believe, one in the starboard bow, and the vessel went down. And I probably at that time, you know, there wasn't much thought that anyone would ever be interested in this type of technological history again. And so positions that are marked are always fairly vague, and nobody ever knew where this site was until very recently. Next slide. But there is interest now more in the heritage and the legacy of these physical uh, artifacts of the great events of our time. And so for my agency, for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and our Ocean Exploration and Research Office, as well as for the University of Hawaii, the Undersea Research Lab, uh, we were curious about whether we could find this location or not. And we also benefit from the fact that we have close collaboration with the university between them. NOAA and University, and the University has two very fabulous assets, manned research submersibles, Pisces submarines, actually built back in the 80s uh, in Canada, uh, relatively slow, three knots, battery operated, uh, you can see the area for the command sphere in front, uh, duration of dives are from seven to nine hours, 
Um, now, when I say they're built back in the 80s, of course, the major components are all there, the flotation, the battery system, the thrusters, the descent weights, command sphere. But if, obviously, the, the suite of tools, the manipulators, high definition cameras, onboard sonar, uh, CTD probes, and then in the interior sphere, the, the computer assets have been updated. So, you know, they're not circa 1980 when we died. Next slide, please. <coughs> Usually these are dived in pairs, Pisces 4 and Pisces 5, and this is nice because it gives scientists, if you one pilot on board and two observer scientists, the ability to, to have a larger swath on the bottom, make more observations, and for safety reasons. You know, if one sub does become entangled on the bottom, and we're very conscious of that when these dive, uh, the other sub can locate it with a pinger, and attempt to extract. And so it's nice to dive these in pairs. And there's the ship we dive off of for these submarines, the Kayumikai, uh, Kalo, we call it the KOK. Uh, but of course, mobilizing a big ship and both subs like that comes with a price tag. Next slide, please. So for some operations, there's a capability of diving a single submarine at a time. <coughs> single submarine operations. And here's the launch recovery and transport barge, the LRT, that Pearl has developed. And it's able to be towed in place by a small craft. And then it's diver operated and submerges down to 60 feet where the divers make it hover, stable at 60 feet. A nice platform for the Pisces 5 or 4 to lift off of, conduct its operations barge goes back underwater, land the sub, bring it back up to the air sea interface, and tow back to harbor. Uh, you don't have the two subs, you know, doing the operations for safety considerations, but it's certainly much more economical many times. And let's face it, it's just much more fun to go underwater this way and have the divers swimming around and releasing the turnbuckles. Next slide. Now to begin to understand where we're going to look, we did have some sonar targets in the area. When you look at that film of the I-14 being put down and where the Navy was disposing vessels at that time, there's a backdrop of the mountains of Oahu. And so the Hurl staff actually was able to triangulate the perspective on those landscapes. And with the NOAA data from passing uh, vessels, NOAA and UH data, we combine the multi-beam sonar data, which is the depth information and the colors, with the backscatter sonar data, which gives you an idea of the bottom type, but it's all the same source of sonar data. And we see the same target cropping up in the same spot that looks kind of out of place. So it's not just an artifact of the sonar sensors. It's a real target. And that was the target for the I-400. Next slide. Inside the submarines, it's always uh, uh, a fun trip. Don't be claustrophobic. <laughs> don't have a big breakfast. Don't drink a lot of coffee. And <laughs> once you're inside, just, you'll be very friendly with the pilot and with the other observer because we're only talking about spheres that are eight or nine feet in diameter in the interior, crammed with equipment, life support, you know, the oxygen and carbon dioxide scrubbers. And then the variety of controls for the sensing instruments, the recording cameras, CTD, etc. cetera. Uh, so here you can see Terry in position in the upper left as the middle, as the pilot in the middle, the two observation ports for the scientists, and just enough room to really sit up and play footsie with each other, or have a ham sandwich mid-dive. Uh, and it's always nice to include a picture of the one exit point, but that door is not opening until the sub's back at the surface. So. Uh, like I say, don't be claustrophobic in these. Next slide. Sometimes there's a transit on the bottom that could be 20, 25 minutes long, so it's nice to have a little nap. It's possible to relax in the bottom of the ocean after all, even if you can't stretch your legs out. Next slide. So on the dives in, uh, with the dives that discovered the I-400, this is our first contact with what we had from our bathymetry, our uh, multi-beam data, on the bottom with the onboard CTEC scanning sonar. And that contact is actually 360 feet long. 
So we're missing 40 feet and we're scratching our heads wondering, well, maybe that's not it. Maybe it's another submarine. In this case, it actually could have been the Japanese I-23, which is also probably somewhere off of the south shore of Oahu. The I-23 was sent here in March 1942 to assist Operation K, where two long-range flying boats came from the Marshall Islands to the northwestern atolls and down to scout Pearl Harbor prior to the Battle of Midway. The weather did not cooperate. They were not able to make observations. They dropped what bombs they had on the slopes behind my mother's high school, Roosevelt High School, and flew away. But the I-23 never reported in again. So there, you know, this is another possibility. Next slide. <clears throat> but soon after getting on to the target then, um, we saw due to the features, the diagnostic features, this was indeed the, the I-400. Now in this shot, we're over the uh, sail area where the hangar would have been looking forward and there's just the beginning of that launch ramp that you can see, but there's a lot of twisted destruction on the top side of this boat. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that we archaeologists get all excited about, trying to figure out what we're looking at and make the actual identification of the sub. Next slide. Here's a better shot of that launch ramp. We've moved forward a little bit. <clears throat> and also you may be able to see a couple smaller ramps to each side. Those are for the pontoons that would have come out of their own storage area to be attached to the plane and even the folding crane on the port side of the forward deck. And this odd thing that we ended up calling the bear rug. Uh, <laughs> we really didn't know what this was at first. This was a target asset, so nobody lost their lives when they put this submarine down to the bottom. But what this likely is, is cyanobacteria that is growing off of adipose or fatty material. This is probably carcass fall. This is probably a dolphin or a monk seal or something like that that's turning, in, turning back into its various biological components. But it looked just like a bear rug. Next slide. On the stern deck, um, the deck gun is pretty clear. In this case, you know, for this 140 millimeter type Japanese deck gun, it looks like there's a shroud covering it, covering the breech area. It's actually not material but metal, it's not cloth but metal and thin metal and what we think is this had some kind of metal cover and just the force of the water on it as this thing was struck and descended to the bottom just contorted that metal cover into what looks like a fabric shroud. And you can see the steel deck beams here, uh, the deck and the structure but not the wooden planks many of which are gone because they've been eaten away by various sea worms and bacteria and microorganisms. Treated worm is one type of sea worm that eats wood. At these depths, there are others as well. Next slide. What's really diagnostic about uh, this bow shot is the eight torpedo tubes. Four torpedo tubes in the upper torpedo room, four in the lower torpedo room, all stacked on each other. And when we got to the bow, we realized this is why the sonar target is 360 feet long, or 350. There's about 50 feet of the bow is missing. It's just broken off, maybe from that damage to, from that starboard uh, torpedo hit. And the bow has fallen over. You can see just the end of the forward launch ramp that has fallen off the top deck, and the eight torpedo tubes. And then in the left picture, the uh, twin screws and the dive planes and rudders at the stern and the cabling, which we think is some of that degaussing cabling that was wrapped around the sub continuously to demagnetize it as a target. Next slide. This gives you a little clearer image of the destruction at the forward end. You know, we're not looking at the end of the, of the torpedo tubes that they came out of. This is kind of mid-torpedo tube broken off, about 50 feet back. No other submarines had those stacked torpedo rooms with the eight tubes. Next slide. On the stern quarter, um, we're looking forward and you can see evidence of implosion damage. So there were compartments that were probably closed as this thing headed for the bottom, 547 meters of water. 
the crumpled implosion damage. Next slide. And then in the debris trail, aft of the main body of the submarine, you come across the large, very heavy hangar door, <coughs> a watertight hangar, broken off, pointy end down, interior side facing up in the huge steel hinge that held that heavy door on. And this is obviously a two sub dive we're doing because there's one image from the five at the four making observations. Next slide. Here's the hangar itself. Uh, damage, the lower part of the hangar is to the right, so the top side of the hangar is to the left. It's broken off, it is in the debris field, large enough that we could have driven the Pisces sub right inside, but um, you know, pilots don't like that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm done to find out. Very wary of entanglement hazards, and uh, so are we as the observers on board. Next slide. We actually came across all three of the triple mount 25 millimeter anti-aircraft <coughs> guns. In the diagram on the bottom, you can see the position of those on top of the watertight hangar. And we found all three of them scattered in the debris field. So these things flew off the top side of the hangar as the sub was making its descent uh, to the bottom. And then the heavy weight of those barrels kind of flipped the, the mounts over. And you can see kind of the, the barrels going into the sand and the, the seat, one of the seats for an anti-aircraft gun here. Next slide. We couldn't figure out what this was for a long time, this long tube along the side of the submarine, and then we realized, well, this is the chamber for the pontoons. It's just kind of fallen outboard of the starboard side above the torpedo damage. Uh, next slide. And then the, the bridge on the sail, the periscope's undamaged, shiny. Uh, periscope sticking out of the bridge, which has fallen over on its side. And then you can see the various mounts for binoculars, the radio direction finder, access hatch, etc. Um, on those. And that was a very interesting sight to see. I have to show you all of these individual images because, you know, the, the bottom of the ocean is pitch black. And we have lights on the sub, but we operate off of batteries, so they're not the super brightest lights ever. So it really is like being a cave diver, or being in a dark cavern with a small flashlight, and we're only looking at one thing at a time. You could never see this entire site at all. Uh, again, really, with the equipment we have today, it remains in darkness, except for, next slide, please. The artistic impression, and fortunately, Terry Kirby is also an accomplished artist. And so using the still images, the video, and our understanding of the dive and Terry's memory, basically. Terry is able to produce uh, a wonderful interpretation of this site. You know, it's not probably as accurate as measured maps and the kind of archaeology we're able to do in shallower waters, but certainly it's pretty close. And you can see here the entire length of the main hull, uh, the Pisces 5, the broken bow, the destruction topside where the superstructure was, and then the debris trail aft, the hangar, the hangar door, et cetera. And it's a wonderful picture, and we're really um, privileged to be able to uh, take, make use of his artistic abilities. Next slide. Because we use that image as our site plan to, to Naval History and Heritage Command, which are the managers of this property at the Washington, D.C. Naval Yard, so we submitted later on the application and the proposal to bring the bell up and to make an exhibit at both the museum of the bell from the I-400. And uh, you know, we all know bells are a very nice item to bring back if you're going to bring anything back. I mean, for their symbolic importance, of course, their ceremonial functions, and also for the fact that they regulated the activities and operations on a daily basis of Navy vessels. Uh, and frankly, because it's affordable. <laughs> the idea of bringing the bridge up, or one of those triple anti-aircraft guns, you know, uh, an artifact composed of different metals, something heavy like that from 540 meters, and then conserving the thing, it would just be prohibitively expensive. Uh, a copper object like this, a bronze object, relatively small, excellent for outreach purposes with the public. So the application was accepted. 
And the command, of course, is the manager of this property under the Sunken Military Craft Act of 2004, which means that all military vessels underwater, no matter where they are, for the United States, are still sovereign property of the U.S. government, uh, unless they're specifically abandoned, I think, by an act of Congress. So that's the reason for the application process, and that's those are the types of laws my agency deal in to protect historic properties of various natures. Next slide. There's the bell at the in the case that we in the bucket we constructed for the submarine and some staff from the Bofin Museum who assisted in chipping that to the conservation lab, Charles Hinman and Nancy Richards. Next slide. And the bell itself, we took a few very hasty photos because we don't want to let the bell dry out. We don't want to give that corrosion product permanently adhering to the bronze surface. Um, so it's not in bad shape, and it's very similar to other Japanese bells from their destroyers anyway. We didn't see any writing on it, any marking, and that's not that unusual. Not all of them are, are inscribed with the name of the vessel, always. We saw what we thought could have been one crack on the interior surface. So this came up from 500 meters. And then all of a sudden along this crack, there's this product that's oozing out, this oxide. Uh, what we hoped was that it was just a surface layer, some you know, uh, water uh, being released from the pressure differential and not a crack all the way through the bell. Next slide. Off it went into a very large and expensive Pelican box shipped to uh, Cal State University in Chico. We don't have the conservation facility in Hawaii to be able to stabilize marine artifacts like this. So we work in collaboration with other labs. And here's Dr. Georgia Fox in the process of some of that conservation. The bell's looking better already. Next slide. And that's how it looks as of, I think, last week. It's already getting cleaned up. The patina is beginning to come off of the copper. It's starting to look better. That crack is not appearing anymore. So it probably was just a surface, very thin layer. Uh, but it'll be a while before this is done. It's undergoing this kind of low amp electrolysis process, uh, which will remove the, will make the corrosion products on the surface more permeable and wash out the chlorides from the bronze. And in the end, it'll be stabilized and looking fairly good. August 2017 is the expected completion date. Next slide. Now what I want to do is put this in context because for my field, you know, we're interested not just in the assessment of individual archaeological sites underwater, but really understanding the resource as a whole. So context is important. This I-400 was one of five Japanese submarines brought out by prize crews back to Pearl Harbor from Japan after the war to be examined. Interesting pieces of uh, nautical advancement in technology, certainly, both of the I-400 class subs, I-400 and I-401, of course, the I-201 the I and the I-203, which has still not been found. The 201 and 203, fast, specialized fast attack subs. Uh, these had deck guns that could recess into the deck, retracting deck guns, very small sail on top of the boat, um, very small crews, these submarines did 19 knots submerged and only 15 knots at the surface. We didn't have anything like that, I think, at the time. Very interesting, but again, a story of just too little, too late, right? That's been discovered. Uh, and the I-401 submarine, which has been found as well, you can see that large hangar on the second picture on the right. The door still attached to the whole hangar, kind of right side up on the seafloor. And then the I-14, which was a smaller version carrying two uh, aircraft in the watertight hangar. That's been discovered as well. And it really is through the, the interest and capabilities of the Hawaii Industry Research Lab and Terry Curry, Kirby and his, his team that things like this get found in the deep ocean. Next slide. To put those five, five submarines in context, let me just talk about submarines that we know of lost in Hawaiian waters. Uh, 
Uh, part of our job as cultural resource managers is to understand the resource base, the total inventory. So this comes out of that work, and here you can see the number of, in class of American submarines that we have documented uh, records for their loss, if not their discovery. The Japanese submarines, which have been lost, and many of them discovered already, and this of course includes uh, the two uh, Koyoteki, the special secret weapons, the Japanese mini-subs that were engaged in the attack on Pearl Harbor. And that's a topic for a whole different talk, of course. And even a German submarine from World War I. You might say, well, what is that about? Are you kidding me? I don't think so. This was long after World War I. The, the Hulk was being towed somewhere in the Pacific, uh, broke free from its tow, and there was a report that it was west of Oahu when the German submarine was lost. We don't know where that is. The images show you one of those Japanese mini-subs, the one off of Pearl Harbor sunk by the USS Ward. And since I mentioned that one, I will also say that the book called The Lost Submarines of Pearl Harbor has just come out. My friend uh, Jim Delgado, I know a colleague, and I and Terry Kirby and others have co-authored um, this book that goes into the full history and archaeology of the Japanese news subs at Pearl Harbor as well as elsewhere in the Pacific. By, and it's come out by Texas A&M Press. That sounds like a little personal interest that I can give you that information, but all proceeds go to our foundation, so we're not making anything out of that. But I should have brought a copy for you to look at. I guess me, yes. The S-19 is an S-class sub that was disposed intentionally as a target asset in the 1930s. We got to do a remotely operated vehicle mission on that from our NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer which has our ROV system for deep ocean research and survey. But the one that I'm interested in, the one that we're working in coordination with Pearl and with Navy History and Heritage Command is finding the S-28. Because the S-28 is not an intentional target asset. This is an older boat that was lost in Hawaiian waters in 1944 during torpedo training with its Coast Guard escort, a US Coast Guard cutter Reliance, just off of uh, Barber's Point, right out here in our ocean, and went down with 49 sailors on board. And so that would be something we're very interested in figuring out where she is. Next slide. Uh, you may be familiar with the story of these older S-class boats. You know, these are the step before the larger fleet-class submarines of World War II. So these were really old workhorses in the, in the 20s and 30s, and many of them started World War II uh, in service. S-28, prior to the outbreak of the war, came from the Atlantic, served in the Pacific, out of Hawaii and San Diego, and then once the war started, was sent immediately up to Dutch Harbor and did five war patrols in that very difficult environment in the Aleutian Islands and the Russian Islands in the far north, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that story. Uh, as well. Finally, after those five patrols, she was sent to Pearl Harbor in 1944 when she was conducting some training, was lost with all hands. Next slide. In our efforts to get on to this project, you know, of course, we don't have a specific location. Uh, that site, probably 2,200 meters, obviously too deep to use drag line search at that time, so I believe the search efforts when she was lost consisted of uh, sonar and looking on the surface for a surface submarine. But there was a diesel slick in the general area, and then we have reviewed a lot of existing bathymetric data, sonar data, uh, and have proposed at various times projects with uh, private foundations and the Bowfin Museum, and of course my agency and uh, University of Hawaii, and that's where we're at in the effort to um, find some outside funds that will allow us to use some high resolution deep side scan sonar to refine the target area. Our multi-beam sonar from our ships uh, is not refined enough at these depths to pick out a target like that and that type of terrain on the bottom. But every time our NOAA ships do pass over, I do ask them to turn on the equipment so we get a little more information each time. Next slide. And this is the reason why it's important, not just as a historical and archeological potential find, but it means closure for Navy families. 
and the last crew of the S-28. Some of these sailors were part of that last crew, some not. This is actually a picture of S-28's crew at Dutch Harbor in Alaska during the war. Uh, so when she came down here, she got a new commanding officer, swapped out some of the crew members, took on some trainees, and that's when she was lost. Um, important to us, important to the uh, DPAA, uh, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, which used to be JPAC, Joint POW MIA Accounting Command. Uh, I think important for all of us. Next slide, please. Now, talking about those types of losses and being here in Hawaii, I just want to put things in a little larger context and talk about um, the kind of training that was going on in the Hawaiian Islands during the war and the broader base of this type of resource. Our inventory work allows us to begin to put real numbers to the documented losses and the discovered uh, properties underwater. The chart shows you vessel losses per decade from 1790 to 2000. And you can see in the beginning, <laughs> per decade, one maybe no vessels lost, of course, in 1790. But when that starts to rise, uh, in the 1840s, 1850s, what are we talking about? The plantation economy beginning to make a reason for much more inter-island maritime traffic. <laughs> Sailing traffic, schooners, barks, brigs, and then 1870s, 1880s, small steamships. So more traffic, more losses. We're beginning to look at you know 20, 30 losses per decade, two or three a year. That's all right, I guess. You can pick out the war years in this chart, though, the decade of the 1940s, uh, up to 56. So now five or six vessels lost in accidents and in intentional disposals. Many of those losses are, of course, due to the intensity of activity in the Hawaiian Islands. Military losses, Navy ships, Navy aircraft, landing craft, amphibious assault vehicles. And here is a group of UH science divers. We teach an underwater course in maritime archaeology. And we use these divers to document and assess sites like that, Amtrak and LVTA-4, which was lost during training exercises off of Maui in 1944 for Operation Forager, um, Saipan, invasion of Saipan. In the pie chart below on the left, you can see the large blue swath. Those are schooners. Next slide, please. Those were waves of LVTs charging Maui's beaches, training the, that timing. The, I think that we understand and have looked at certainly a lot the combat operations in the Pacific, and those are very important, but I don't think that the home front has gotten that same kind of attention. Some of the attention, attention it has garnered are from the social history side, and that's very important, and it's a huge story here in Hawaii, and I'm sure you don't need to, be, to remind you the importance of the war years for these islands. In terms of almost anything you want to mention, you know, our social structure, the political environment, the economy, uh, the culture, just certainly the story of, of Japanese Americans and what it meant for them here in Hawaii to suddenly run for those recruiting stations and then come back and serve as our politicians and our educators in what is now the state of Hawaii and then, of course, the territory. So it is a, a very interesting and very large topic my own connection begins at this point as well. In the picture on the left, you can see my Auntie Evelyn and my mother. <laughs> yeah, 1942. Uh, and that's not my father. <laughs> my, my father was in the Army. Apologies. Next slide. But what interests me these days is you know, not just that social history, but the intensity of training activities in these islands. And I'm fortunate because that involves part of my work in understanding these submerged historic properties, many of which were lost during the training exercises. That these aren't just combat losses from Pearl Harbor. Um, here you see one of the maps that's now at the National Archives in College Park. The deployment areas from the LSTs for putting in the, the Amtraks and all the other vessels that were engaged in these very large operations in trainings and rehearsals for what are 
you know, incredibly complex uh, maneuvers and probably the most dangerous of the basic functions of the Navy, right? Putting forces ashore in hostile territory. Next slide. I mentioned aircraft earlier on. I just want to say that of our inventory, most of our recorded losses are actually aircraft. It's a testament to the dedication of our armed forces and our pilots and engineers and the logistical power of the United States. How many aircrafts are lost between 1922 and 1952? Well, maybe one or two a year until you get to the war years. And there in 1945, we're looking at 540 some aircraft. That's one or two Navy aircraft lost every day for the entire year on average. Many of those were ditches and they were successful in getting out of those planes. Some they weren't successful. So this is an important resource for us to understand underwater and to uh, preserve in terms of respecting these sites. These are not up for grabs when divers find them, right? But our divers here do love to find these sites. It's very interesting to them. And they like that aspect of history. You can see a number of projects we've worked on underwater. Some are deep water discoveries from the Hurl folks. Some are shallow water discoveries. Uh, and the pie chart shows you, you know, large slices in the gray, the blue, the purple, the red. We're talking about Hellcats, Helldivers, Corsairs, and Avengers. Hundreds of them. Next slide, please. This is one project we worked on in Kaneohe Bay. Um, a PBY-5 that was one of those moored on the bay at the time of the attack. So this is a, a combat casualty. And uh, it's very important for the history of the Marine Corps base. Of course, then it was a naval air station. And we used student divers to document this in very murky conditions. I mean, a very accurate, measured drawing, plan view of this PBY-5. And we'd be interested in finding the other PBYs that were on the bay that were also struck minutes prior to the attack at Pearl Harbor. Next slide, please. Here are two images of that. I have to tell you that this took a lot of um, uh, photo software manipulation to make the murky water disappear. <laughs> and here you see the bow of that PBY canted over uh, onto her starboard side, the turret to the left, and the bomber's window, bomber's window to the right. And then in the cockpit itself, you'll notice the throttles are in different positions. This plane is still attached to the mooring. So those throttles are in positions where it looks like somebody was, may have been firing up the port engine to get this thing off the water when she was struck. Next slide. So if you're talking about the resource as a whole then, this is a small scale image of how it begins to look for the main Hawaiian islands. In our database now we have 2,114 entries of all documented losses, including confirmed discoveries, 397 confirmed discoveries underwater. Sometimes people don't realize that Hawaii is a huge location of submerged wrecks and other types of properties. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we sell ourselves like that as a diving destination, but these are certainly for navigation and transportation on the sea, for maritime transport, these are hazardous waters. And for all of those pilots, you know, who came out here from the mainland and suddenly found themselves flying in close formation, doing dangerous combat maneuvers over unfamiliar waters, uh, there are just lots and lots of planes. This shows you in the green triangles. I don't know if you can make it all out. Those are the confirmed locations. Someone's been there with a camera. Someone's hit the button on the GPS unit. We have a location. Yellow is we pretty sure we think we know where it is. Orange is, well, if you want to invest some funds in finding it, maybe in red, don't even look. <laughs> but at least we have a rough position estimate. Most of those red triangles are aircraft. And in fact, this image doesn't show you about a thousand of the Navy aircraft because those were simply recorded as uh, lost Pacific Ocean Hawaiian Islands. And you can't even begin to estimate the position there. Next slide. So for us, um, this is a special type of inventory. And for, for all of us who really appreciate and are passionate about the past, about history, about cultural resource preservation, about discovery, 
the Navy story in the Hawaiian Islands is huge. Here is the most of the list of shipwrecks, none of the aircraft, but the submarines, uh, landing craft, surface vessels, uh, American, Japanese, uh, plus you know a dozen or so barges, uh, thirty or so aircraft we know about, many landing craft and LVTs, dozens and dozens of those. The yellows are the ones that we found. The whites are still yet to be found. And it just means for folks in my profession, um, this is an important uh, resource base to be aware of and to appreciate. Um, and so it makes what I do for my job, you know, it makes me feel very good to be involved in that. I hope you can see from this talk on submerged cultural resources and the perspective of naval history from that underwater archaeology angle that uh, for us, Davy Jones is just another name for a museum curator. <laughs> Thank you very much.